hi everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining us on the fourth uh, Expert Bureau. Uh, I'm John Higginson, the founder of Higginson Strategy, a communications agency for purpose-driven organizations. We set up Expert Bureau at the, uh, really at the start of lockdown when we saw that people's opinions had changed over the last four years. You'll have seen there in that clip that we showed, Michael Gove, the uh, cabinet minister, four years ago say that Britain had had enough of experts. And what we found during lockdown, obviously, is everyone's turning to experts on the health issues. But what we've found through polling is that, they've, that they're turning to experts on a whole range of different issues. Uh, we, we carried out polling with Populous and found that 70% more people are likely to listen to experts uh, today. Uh, so Expert B Bureau was set up as a service for journalists, really, so that we could get some of the great experts that we know, put them in touch with those journalists, many of whom are still working at home, uh, and, and uh, allow those people to get their voices heard by the members of the public that really want to hear from them. So for our subject of today, what is the future of transport? We'll be talking about uh, some of the big questions that have come up. We've got a, a fascinating panel uh, coming up ahead of us. Um, and really some of, those, some of those issues for all the way from rail to electric vehicles to uh, 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 taxis and other forms of transport. Joining us today, Kerry McCarthy, the Shadow Tran Transport Minister. Um, I was lucky enough to interview uh, Kerry on our um, Behind the Story uh, podcast about veganism. So if that's something that's of interest to you and you want to hear about how you can uh, do your part for the planet with that, please do listen to that. That's on iTunes and our website. You can find it on SoundCloud. Michael Hurwitz is Director of Transport for, uh, Innovation at Transport for London. Welcome, Michael. Dominic Moxon Tritch is Director of Regulation and Public Policy at Bolt. Uh, and I was lucky enough to work with Dominic at Uber, which seems like many, many moons ago uh, when they first came to the UK. Natalia Peralta Silverstone is Head of Propositions at Octopus Elect Electric Vehicles. And John Elledge uh, uh, hasn't been able to join us yet, but is the columnist for the New Statesman. Welcome to all of you. So if I can just address that first question to all of you. Um, John, you are there. Sorry, I wasn't able to see all the, all the faces there because I was, I was just talking at a blank screen. So uh, uh, thanks for joining us, John. Um, so if I can direct that question first to Kerry, what is the future of transport? Okay, well... Obviously, uh, I could talk at great length on this, but I thought that probably the easiest way to approach it would be to sort of say what I'm actually looking at in terms of my green transport brief. So I cover green transport and the, the future of transport, but there's obviously a, a lot of overlap. So the key priorities for me is how do we embed the move towards active travel during lockdown? We sort of see that um, car use is almost back to normal. It's in the 90 something percent. Uh, public transport is still well below 50% of what it was, depending on the mode, um, and cycling is still up. But I think unless we embed that with you know, better infrastructure and then the, the more ambitious plans like the mini Hollands or the livable neighbourhoods or low traffic neighbourhoods, whatever you want to call them, um, we may soon lose that advantage, particularly just you know, as the weather gets worse and as people do return to public transport. Um, there's a whole, I think, social justice issue about access to bikes and, um, you know, safety of bikes, people having on-street storage where they can actually keep their bikes safe and the fact that the Cycle to Work scheme doesn't cover um, a lot of people eligible for it if, you know, if you're self-employed, you're a minimum wage and so on. And then um, where do e-scooters and e-mopeds and all this sort of thing fit into the mix because it's one thing putting in a two-foot wide cycle lane but once you start having the e-scooter pilots and all that, um, it's th that issue about the road space is, um, there's an awful lot of questions. One thing also is some local authorities are really good on this. There's others that I think need a lot more pressure put on them to actually adopt this agenda. Um, on the, the car use in particular, Labour's policy is 
to uh, bring forward the, the, the ban on the sale of new ICE vehicles to 2030. Government is technically 2040, but consulting on bringing it um, to maybe 2035, and the Committee on Climate Change said 2032. So I'm kind of looking at, you know, the government is very much just looking at charging infrastructure as, and then the market will lead the way. If you look at what France and Germany are doing, which is tied in with the whole green recovery package, so support for car manufacturing, they're looking at things like you know, scrappage schemes, uh, uh, zero emission vehicle mandates, more on grants and that. Um, so there's, there's a lot that I'm doing with Lucy Powell in Bayes on that. And distribute. one of the things, obviously there's a whole issue about people not working, not going into the office as much. But another thing that's happened during lockdown is the rise in online deliveries. And we're looking at whether we should be looking at distribution hubs around cities with then things being decanted into e-vans or e-cargo bikes, and just how you plan for that. Um, obviously, from shipping to trains to buses, there's a whole issue about moving to cleaner vehicles as well, and sustainable aviation fuels, lighter aircraft. Although I was quite sceptical of all those things before I got this brief and actually had sort of meetings, I thought that people talking about the you know the technological approach to reducing aircraft emissions rather than just reducing demand. Um, was a bit of a you know a bit of greenwash on it and a bit of a distraction, but actually there's some really interesting stuff going on in terms of you know electric short haul flights and hydrogen ca carbon capture and storage for longer flights. Even just tidying up airspace could reduce emissions by 15 percent because planes could fly in direct lines and not have to sort of circle for ages. So um, yeah, and as I said, you know maritime. Um, uh, all, all that side of things, you know, looking at decarbonisation across the board. So that's a quick canter through what I'm up to. Great. So it's a really interesting point, Sarah, um, you know, talking about how we deal with electric scooters as, as they come along. Lots of talk on electric. Uh, I mean, I, I remember just, just two, week, uh, it's two or three weeks ago that the Sunday Times ran on the front page how lots of uh, flights had saved about 20% on fuel because they were just going in a straight line now instead of the... Uh, 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 traditional routes that came in in the 1950s or something that they've been following. Um, so that's really interesting, and I'd, I'd love to come back to you on how you're working with Bayes and working with the with the with the with the government. That issue that you raised there of online del deliveries, how we deal with that. Um, uh, Nat Nat Natalia, let's 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 bring you in now. Talking about electric vehicles, what's what's the view from Octopus? Yeah, I mean, Kerry's actually already touched upon um, a few of the elements of what's, of what's going on and what we need to be focusing on now as part of the recovery, like other countries are doing. Um, I can speak uh, as to what we've been seeing uh, as we, I'm not sure if we're coming out of lockdown, if I'm honest, um, but at this point in the process, um, sales are still really strong. So we actually lease electric cars, electric, electric vehicles, and we're part of an energy company. So we tie it all in. Um, and we've actually seen more demand than pre-COVID. Now that could be latent demand of people who couldn't get cars during COVID. Um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of elements that show that that might not be the case. So, you know, this time last year, we've seen a 250% increase in sales from the same period. Um, and we're also seeing people look at EVs in a, in a greener way. So not just it's a car that gets me from A to B, but we've seen um, huge benefits around air quality whilst we've been in lockdown. You know, you take vehicles off the road, um, we're gonna have better air quality in our cities. And if we're, gonna be, if we're going to put cars back on the road, which we're not necessarily advocating that everyone should drive a car, you know, do take public transport if you can, um, it should at least have zero tailpipe emissions. So we're also seeing a shift there in terms of mindset and why people are buying. Um, there are a couple of elements we need to be mindful of coming out of lockdown. It's not just about lockdown. You know, we have Brexit coming in January um, and that can affect the motor trade industry considerably. Um, and we need to continue to, con we need to continue offering support to this industry. So, you know, the motor trade has been really affected in terms of sales um, and they've also been I guess fundamentally affected in the sense that they have to be in physical dealerships to sell cars. So companies like ours are actually doing quite well because we're digital, but there still needs to be some support there to help this, um, I guess, this trade survive kind of post-lockdown post -lock, post um, reality. And there's a real opportunity now to 
get behind pure electric vehicles or clean transport. You know, it doesn't just have to be electric, but it should be um, purely clean transport. So I think it's now time to kind of move away from kind of your, your plug-in hybrids. Um, and if we're going to be supporting part of this industry, it should be electric. Great, thank you. So some really good, good points there. And uh, just, uh, just, a, just a note to the uh, uh, participants in this, if you're in the audience, we can't see you, you can see us. Please do, uh, there's a, if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A uh, button there. There are about 50 of you in the audience, and we know that each one of you has probably got a quite pertinent question. If you don't put your questions on there, you're only going to hear questions from me because I've got lots for this, for this panel. So please do put your question in there. You can also chat if it's not a question and you just want to make comments on, on the things being said. You can chat in the sidebar. When you put your question, you'll, you'll, you'll do me a big favor if you put your name and where, you, and, and where you're from. And if your question is to a particular panel member, can you just add that in there as well? I will be picking up those questions um, uh, from, from the audience and, and, uh, and, and putting those to the panelists so that they don't need to worry about looking at those. Uh, Dominic, let's, let's uh, bring you in now um, on, on the view from the taxi trade. Sure. Okay, well, Bolt is a competitor to Uber. We operate in about 40 countries throughout Europe, Middle East and Africa. We've got about a million drivers globally, 300,000 in Europe and 40,000 in London. So we are the second biggest PHV operator in the UK, just for context, because we don't do a lot of advertising and marketing, so not everyone knows who Bolt is. We also operate e-bikes and electric scooters as well. Look, to Kerry's point, um, our volumes, both globally, but also in London, are back to pre-COVID levels. You know, our total number of trips last week in London was a record. You know, the sort of beating our sort of number in early February, which was our highest number. So I think for the first thing that we're seeing is there has been a significant um, substitution by passengers who've moved away from mass transit and into cars, whether privately owned or via ride hailing networks. And that is clearly unsustainable, not least because of another point that Kerry made about the removal of road space. So there has been a shift in infrastructure away from accommodating private vehicles, be they cars, be they vans, and towards active transport modes. And this has been systemic all over Europe. We saw the same thing happen in France, in Paris. We saw the same thing happen in Berlin. And I think this, this shift towards active transport modes is something that we would like to see public authorities continue to push on to make sure that we sustain that modal shift. And for private operators such as us, I think that there is a responsibility for us, for example, in using, you know, nudge type techniques to push people who might otherwise, you know, summon a private hire vehicle for a short run journey, encouraging people to use e-bikes or e-scooters, howsoever they are to be accommodated on the roads, toward out of ICE vehicles and onto green at point of use um, transport modes. So I think that's the first thing. I think looking into the medium term, I think there will inevitably be a gradual reversion to the norm because I think you know we are in a completely unsustainable position at the moment with people avoiding mass transit, public transit in favour of private vehicle use. Um, I think in terms of the sort of long range trends and the kind of things that's on Michael Hurwitz's agenda, I think we're going to see ever more integration of you know private sector transport providers such as us into publicly owned transport networks. TfL was a world leader here in making it API, which is a way of joining databases together in opening TfL's APIs so companies such as us could integrate into them. I think we will see more of that kind of thing going forward. I think the days of the likes of, you know, Bolt simply paying a license fee to exploit a scarce public assets such as road space are over. I think the future looks much more like you know real-time data sharing with public authorities so that public authorities such as TfL are able to glean the benefit of you know the scale of our data sets not to mention their own. Great so some some uh, uh, positive comments from Dominic towards Michael there I don't know if that's going to help with any uh, licenses or anything else but um, is is um so, so very interesting to hear from Dominic that, that actually while uh, lots of people in London in particular are still working from home, 
he's saying that the number of car journeys are at the, were last week at the at the maximum level that they'd ever 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 hit. Um, now we know that that that, that people have been uh, people have been getting mixed mixed messages on a whole load of things from, from from the government. But one of the mixed messages they've got is go into the office but don't use public transport. I remember we, I, I read a week or two ago that um, that that one company was was telling people that they that if they ever that if they use public transport they'd have to go on quarantine for two weeks, which I think is appalling. I, I'll say I have been using. Public transport to get into the office for, for since uh, since July, uh, and it's and it's been absolutely great. It's, it, it, it's felt like one of the safest places in London when you when you consider when you go to the pubs, the parks, uh, restaurants, and stuff, and there's hardly anyone on it. Um, Michael, why don't you tell us about your situation then? Because I, I don't think it's quite, it doesn't sound like so far it's been quite as rosy as as, as, as Dominic's is. Well, it's been extremely challenging, and and I can. Um... You know, talk about kind of where we've been so far and 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 what we're going to see in short term and then maybe in the longer term um you know it's uh i think the first thing i've got to say is that the traditional economics of transport currently do not apply you know there was there was this basic principle that you know if if, if transport was big enough and busy enough uh then it kind of washes its face you know uh, uh london historically has been what i think was it something like 72 percent covered by fare box uh, revenue um and clearly that just fell away in the deepest darkest moments of uh, of lockdown tube patronage was down 95 percent buses were down 85 percent um uh you know for, for various reasons because we only wanted to encourage essential trips around there you know uh, there was no congestion charge etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think the first thing to say is that you know the economics is uh, uh, it's just not sustainable uh, and I think uh, whilst I, I do agree uh, with Dominic that there will be some reversion to the norm um, it's going to feel a little bit less certain than it was you know I think that uh, there's some really big interesting and difficult questions about how much people will return to where they were before you know um, people are getting the value of uh, uh of having more flexibility a lot of businesses are thinking about uh well do they need the same kind of footprint of uh of office space in commercial centers etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think the first thing is that a lot of the traditional assumptions are now uh being challenged and shaken um and uh, uh you know that, that creates long-term uncertainty where we are now is that we're trying to do everything we can uh to make uh, uh, public transport safe uh, and to make people feel as confident as they can in it you know we're using hospital grade antiviral cleaners on everything putting um, uh, 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 dispensers of, of, of hand gel on every station uh, the, the compliance with wearing masks is actually pretty high uh, not uniformly throughout the day but it's, it's pretty high and uh, huge information campaigns to try and make people feel more comfortable about this um, and you know transport is going to be part of getting city life and talking from London's point of view you know urban urban life uh, back to a form of normal that we can all you know, recover economically socially and from an inclusion point of view so you know, we're trying to do a lot of things I think what I would say is and building up on some of the points is that good set of questions about how much will COVID change things for the long term. I just wanted to, to mention two, is that I think the first one is about the spatial distribution between you know, city and commercial centres versus the suburbs. You know, I think there's a really interesting question is whether we will return uh, to the, um, uh, uh, whether we'll return to the same amount of uh, commercial space um uh, and kind of density that we had before uh, our economics does depend on that but are we going to see a resurgent localism i think that's a really interesting question you know local areas might become more vibrant but that might put pressure on commercial centers i think the second thing is is that and i have a strong sense here that some of these behavioral shifts that we've seen through lockdown might be accelerated into uh the business as usual so for example i would argue uh, you know the shift to electric vehicles I think that's accelerated people's adoption of that as an option as a, as, as a potential thing they could uh, move to similarly uh, 
uh, we've mentioned freight and urban delivery. You know, I think people have seen how much they can transact not by going out. And I think that's the kind of stuff that some of the really interesting questions are. You know, what, uh, where do people place themselves in their businesses? What are the modes they choose? And how do they get their products and services? I think uh, that's the really uh, interesting set of variables for the future now. Great, very interesting. And actually some of those things that you're talking about there is really brings us into the future of living, the future of working as well. And John, that's something you've written a lot about. You've written a lot about uh, what cities of the future look like. Um, is there anything you, you want to add to, to what Michael said there? What, what does the future of transport look like in, in you know, five, ten years' time? Uh, well, the, the honest answer, I think, is... Um, am I audible, by the way? I'm always paranoid about this. You are, yeah. yeah. I, I, okay. I had the same problem when I was just staring into a blank screen and couldn't see anything. <laughs> That's, that's, that's fine. Okay, excellent. Um, I mean, the honest answer is we, we don't know, do we? Because we're still very much in the middle of the situation. Uh, we have no idea whether the talk of, of people working from home en masse uh, for the long term is, is overblown or not. So much of, of what the transport system has currently constituted is for is, is around commuting. It's effective. So, so transport policy is sort of slightly dictated by the relative positions of homes and workplaces. Commuting is, is literally one of, one of you know, a handful of inventions that enabled cities to get bigger than a million people. If you look, if you look back at the, sort of the history of the largest uh, city in the world, uh, it kind of hovers around one million for 2,000 years nearly. And then, they, then when we invent the train, suddenly it becomes possible to have cities of 6, 10, 20, 30 million. Um, so it's, it's, it's hugely important. Uh, and also a shift to, to the service economy has seen more and more of our, our economy dragged into fewer and fewer places. So you ended up with a situation where, you know, cities like London or Oxford or, or Bristol to a certain extent end up with, with crazy house prices. Uh, because that's where the jobs are. And there's other places where housing is much more affordable, but, but there aren't any jobs. Um, if, if the talk of more people working from home isn't just talk, if that becomes a thing where people don't go into the office five days in a week anymore, they might probably be you know, within a couple of hours of the office so they can go in two days or something. But suddenly a lot of people are working from home. All of these assumptions around which we've built, not just our transport system, but our entire economy for the past 30, 40 years, could topple in a way that's going to be quite unpredictable in, in the way it plays out. Um, so, so, so much of government transport investment, uh, not just this government, but governments going back decades, has been in and around London because somewhere in Whitehall there is a spreadsheet that shows it is very easy to make a, a commercial case for something like Crossrail because if you build another big railway line under London, it will be possible to boost the economy by 0.5% or something. You can see the sort of cost benefit stacks up quite easily, whereas building I don't know, a speculative due tram network in, in Bradford, it's harder to make that case. If, if suddenly, like, we don't need however many people a day commuting into central London, is the mass there going to stack up anymore? Is it possible we're going to find out we've been investing in totally the wrong things? Um, and the boring answer is right now, we don't know. Uh, I don't think we, we have the faintest idea what the world of work and therefore the world of commuting and therefore the future of transport is going to look like in five years' time. Because we don't know if, if this is kind of a short-term shift or something that's going to have a much longer, longer tail. Um, there was an interesting thread I spotted on Twitter the other day by, uh, I, I can't remember who it was, but someone pointing out that the reason people are not going back to the office is not just because they're scared, it's also because it's not easy to make the case that they will get anything out of it. The economy as a whole might, but individual people will not. So unless there is something on offer to sort of push people back to the old ways of doing things, it's possible that things, things are going to change. Um, the other point I just wanted to make is briefly at this point was... Um, a sort of more short term one. I think there is an inherent tension in the way the sort of COVID era transport policy has been managed. Obviously the fear of, of crowded public transport is pushing people towards these more private options. We are seeing sort of gratifying shift towards um, cycling policy. We're seeing you know, attempts to set aside more space for it, uh, attempts to sort of persuade people to get their bikes uh, uh, fixed up or you know, money to invest in, in bike parking stations. Um, not all of these plans will come to fruition. There's been a lot more talk of plans than there have actually been ones that have happened, but we are seeing real things. There's an exciting new network in Coventry, I believe. There are bits of London, we're starting to see this sort of stuff. Um, 
There's also in Greater Manchester, for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, the cycling network is in the outer boroughs and stops dead when you get to the boundaries of the actual city of Manchester. So it's not going brilliantly, but this stuff is happening. But against that, cycling is still very much a minority sport. You know, it's it's not something we're ever going to, we're not something, I don't think we never could. I don't think we are anytime soon going to see a mass move to it. And a lot of the people who are avoiding public transport are in fact going to be uh, moving towards private cars. Um, so so it's that, that's where the tension lies. There is this difficulty because you, to get more people cycling, you need to take space away from cars. But obviously we're, we are now seeing more people moving back to cars. And in any clash between uh, cars and bicycles, whether in, in public policy or on the road, cars do tend to win. So I'm not quite sure how that's going to play out. But I do think we kind of need more, more effort on policy making in that area because the reasons to get people out of their cars aren't purely about emissions and the environment and so on. It's also basic geometry. It's like, you know, someone driving a private vehicle is taking up a lot more space than someone on a bike or on a bus or on a train will. And so those other methods of transport mean you can move more people in smaller spaces. So I think in the long term we definitely need to be working out how to get people out of their cars i'm just not quite convinced that's that's something we're, we're sort of pushing for right now great thank you thank you john and thank you all of you for your opening uh, statements that that brings me quite nicely into uh, we're getting lots of uh, questions from the audience on electric uh, electric scooters and uh, uh, talking about how we get people out of cars uh, rolls on nicely to uh, to a question that's come to us from Thomas McPhail, um, Dominic's already uh, answered in part in, in writing, but I think it's one that's, that would be interesting, uh, interested, interesting, sorry, going to uh, Kerry, in that should we move away from uh, if we legalise electric scooters to when we do, um, using insights from the trials uh, 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 to, to shape that uh, legislation. I'd love to hear as well what you're doing with uh, Bayes uh, on that. And, and uh, Thomas McPhail is from Pure Electric. So when scooters were first mooted, I think there were only going to be four areas. There's four future plans areas that were going to pilot them. It was going to be a genuine pilot. And then the government um, at the start of lockdown, then I think slightly, I don't know whether it was sort of panic mode or whether they thought it was a good opportunity to sort of experiment in more places, but it's happening in, in far more places. And I questioned them, you know, both in writing and through written parliamentary questions as to what the criteria is, what are they trying to find out, what will be deemed to be a success at the end of the pilot. And I don't think they've got any sort of established criteria. I don't think, I think it is basically, as, as, as Tom said, it's this is happening. This is um, this will be a way of perhaps ironing out some of the the problems. And we've we've already seen. I mean, there's been real delay in getting them on stream. But the the ones that were up in um, Tees Valley, there's been issues about people. You know, although there's meant to be an age limit, you're meant to have a provisional license. Uh, the company running them just requires you to tick a box to say it's fine. There's been reports of kids sort of racing through shopping centres on them, which is entirely predictable. It was just obvious that this is going to be a fun thing for kids to do. And there's also the whole issue that people don't, uh, you know, what do you do about people who've bought their own electric scooters and they're going to stop, you know, there are already lots of people using them on the roads when it's illegal to do so. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is basically, this is happening, it's going to be rolled out. Any sort of problems with the schemes will be deemed to be either sort of solvable by tweaking the details of the, the higher schemes or it would be a matter for local authorities. So I think it's there. Um, the question is though, you know, in terms of volume, it's one thing having, I think, yeah, Bristol's due to start its pilot soon and it will be Bristol and Bath. And I think there'll be about 500 scooters, which isn't that many. There's a big difference between 500 rental scooters on the streets of two cities to everybody sort of deciding that e-scooters are the way forward and bringing their own ones um, out onto the streets and it, so so in terms of what the pilots will evaluate um, they're looking at a very very small scale project compared to what the potential would be. Very good. Uh, Dominic do, do you want to just um, uh, add, add to that in case anyone hasn't seen your reply? No absolutely happy to. Um, I mean as Kerry says I mean they are an awful lot of fun to ride and you know, particularly in, say, Bristol, for example, which is hilly, you know, there are, you know, 
predictable. You know, people heading down some of the steeper hills on e-scooters is entirely predictable. There's a question in the chat from Holly Jones uh, about people who are under 16 and whether or not those people have public liability insurance. And I think sh what she's pointing at is a similar uh, issue that Tom McPhail from Pure is pointing out in the Q&A which is that DFT's guidance to local authorities on best practice in e-scooter trials, frankly, was pretty rough and ready. Um, you know, Tom rightly points out that there's no provision made for private ownership, so, you know, use by private individuals. So, in effect, what's being granted is a, you know, a monopoly uh, to uh, operators in local areas. But more importantly, there isn't, for example, a hard and fast requirement that operators, A, should be you know, forced to you know, definitively verify that you know, customers, passengers or riders um, are actually over the age of 16. We can do it. I think we're the only operator that can do it. We'd like to see it made a regulatory requirement to drag everybody else up to the same standards of regulation that the PHV industry already requires us to operate at. Similarly, I mean, it, it's very hard, I think, to justify as an e-scooter operator not having third-party liability insurance in any area of operation. We've committed to it in you know, every area which you know, we might operate in and you know, going forward, we would continue to do so. But I think you know, some of you know, the smaller, um, how shall I put it, sort of you know, more ambitious sort of market entrance um, you know, aren't willing to make this same commitment to public safety. So I think, you know, there are potentially some very great benefits to be had from e-scooters. I think they do have to be carefully controlled. For example, you know, most Paris, for example, there's defined pick-up and drop-off areas, which gets us past the public nuisance problem, uh, which has been pointed to uh, it, also in the q and A, I I mean, this is going to be fiendishly difficult in London, where TfL only controls the strategic road network and a sort of mosaic of 38 local authorities all have jurisdiction over, you know, non-strategic road network. So, you know, potentially every council will have its own policy on pick up and drop off areas. And, you know, we'd like to see when eventually uh, it is you know, possible for operators such as us to bid for um, opportunities to operate e-scooters in London. We'd like, you know, to see absolutely the, the the highest standards and the best practice from regulation from elsewhere in Europe replicated in the capital, because otherwise it's going to be a bun fight. I mean, if you look at, you know, Oslo, I mean, they're knee deep in the damn things at the moment because, you know, bluntly left to their own devices, operators will flood the market to attain a dominant market position, and that's, you know, unsustainable and. Know, Michael and his colleagues are going to have to think about that from the get-go. Yeah, can I can I come in there? Um, I think it's. Uh, I, I take the point now that we we are in a kind of rough and ready environment. I think for the long term, absolutely fundamental to the the micro mobility market is is city permitting powers. Um, I think that's that's uh, absolutely uh, um, you know. A kind of a pass-fail criteria, frankly, for uh, for central government uh, for controlling the rental market, because we've seen it time and time again, where there is no permitting requirement, no ability to control, um, uh, I guess, numbers, safety standards in particular is, I think, our biggest uh, uh, concern in TfL. Uh, you know, it, it, it's open season, you get flooded, uh, and you need to be able through either a permitting regime or some contractual regime, if not regulation, to say, look, these are the standards, these are the operating behaviours that you have to comply to. And that's how you get order. Um, I do think, though, that, um, uh, as, as was already raised, you know, people won't just rent them. And I think there's quite an important point and a, and a role for uh, for government to consider about standards with, with vehicles. You know, some of them are really sturdy in comparison to others some of them are extremely flimsy uh, and um, you know I think that's that is one of the key contributions I think that the trials will make to uh, to central uh, regulatory uh, uh, well the work they're doing to work out how, how they they are treated in law um, and you know what standards if for example they say right we're going to deem them in law as an e-bike uh, what standards do they put alongside that? And I think that, that's, that's a really key question. There is one thing that I do want to say, is that 
uh, with all of this, um, you know, they're, they're going to be part of the mix, I think. You know, I, I, I also feel that the, the door has been opened. We can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, but they're only part of the mix. And, and um, people have a love-hate relationship with e-scooters. Um, I'm not yet convinced of the evidence that they are counted, they should be counted as active travel. You know, uh, we, uh, we in London want people to be, you know, physically cycling. You know, it may well be they're a good thing if they're taking people out of cars for the reasons we've discussed before. They take up less space. Um, uh, as was said, I think it was um, uh, Anthony, I think, raised in, in, in the Q&A, you know, really concerned that we have strong controls over not littering the pavement. You know, we need to, you know, our view is absolutely, you know, pavements are for pedestrians. You know, they, they, they should not be mixing. This is where if you look at the data around the world, um, it's when you have pedestrians and e-scooters mixing, that's when you have real safety issues. And we need to really make sure that that pedestrian space is protected, protected for them. Um, and so I think, you know, the, it's the latest hype thing. And as with all of the hype curve issues, you know, it comes along, it feels like it's gonna be the thing, you know, come into the TFL control room, you know, watch the immense effort that goes around managing the, you know, the, the 6,300 traffic light junctions in London and managing emergencies on the network, the bus network. You look at how the streets are running, you'll go scooters. Yeah, they might help a bit, you know. And so I think that they're exciting and the people that love them really love them. The people that dislike them really hate them. And I think the key thing for us is to say, look, assume the technology is here. We need to shape the policy, shape the regulatory powers, shape the vehicle standards. So that if they do become part of the mass market, then they're as safe as possible, as reliable as possible, and actually protect the issues of all Londoners and don't just give a cool option for the people that feel able or willing to use them. Great, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull us up to, to, a, to a, um, away from e-scooters and, 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 and away from some of those very interesting details. Uh, we've got a question here from Tim Fryer of Engineering and Technology Magazine. And I'd like to pull in Natalia and John on this. He's just uh, he's he's got a, a much broader issue on you know how do we use the opportunity that we've had now we've we've seen across a whole range of areas that lockdown and the pandemic has sped up a number of different areas of our life things that were potentially happening anyway uh, that were maybe going to happen over a number of years and how do we avoid going back to where we were before and use this as an opportunity to a greener future and, I'll, and I'll, I'll put that to Natalia first if you want to give that a go and, and, and actually before I go in there I'm going to chuck in my own my own point there on electric vehicles because I'd I've looked into buying buying an electric vehicle myself and one of the fundamental things that's stopping me is the fact that I don't have a front garden that you can drive into and plug it in um, and you'd have to I'd have to run the lead over a public foot, footpath so if you can answer that 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 question for me that would be brilliant. I will start answering that question with the fact that I also don't have that, but I do have an electric car. We park it on street and we charge it down the road. Our local authority installed some chargers. Um, it's not as convenient as a person who can charge at home. That is definitely the cheapest and most convenient option. But there's also a lot of innovation taking place in that space. So you'll notice it if you look closely, a lot of boroughs installing street lamp chargers. Um, we're involved in innovation projects around um, chargers hidden in the pavement. Yes, it's not quite solved for people who don't have off-street parking, but it's definitely feasible even today. You know, even charging on the public network where it's more expensive than your own domestic electricity, it's still far cheaper than petrol or diesel. Um, so that is possible. I guess going to the broader question around how do we take the learnings, I guess the positive learnings from COVID and, and I'm going to interpret that as, um, I guess there's a refocus on what's important in life and where we spend our time and who we spend our time with, but also there's been a focus on the world we live in, right? Like we've got out of like the four walls of the office and we spend our days in not just a building Monday to Friday. Um, and I think we're becoming a bit more conscious about the impact we're having on the world and transport clearly has a, uh, a big part to play in that you know transport accounts for a big percentage of emissions in our country and globally um, and so i think we need to try and harness public this public understanding i think this this consciousness that 
um, we're starting to now get. And how do we do that? I'm not sure I have a unique solution. I'm not sure there is kind of a, 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 one, a one solution, but I think the government has to give a very clear indication of, of what they're going to back. You know, we've, we've touched upon this already around the green recovery and, and you know, what, um, what we invest into and what we support. Um, but I think there's also a role for private sector and, you know, for, for companies like ours, you know, we're an energy company with quite a big customer base now and have an opportunity to really speak to customers in different ways. And, you know, we've, the, the green agenda is at the heart of what we do, but it's, it's, it's bigger than that, you know, like we engage with companies across all types of sectors every day and everyone can pull sustainability and sustainability into that. And so I think there's got to be a mandate there. I just, I'm not sure quite. I'm not quite sure how you make that happen. Great, thank you. Uh, John, anything you'd like to add on how we can make the most of the opportunity we have now? You're on mute, by the way. I don't know why I'm saying so I am when you tell me I'm on mute, because you can't hear anyway. Um, I mean, my my... If I knew how we could actually sort of uh, do that and embed a, a green revolution at this point, I would probably be a lot richer and more successful than I in fact am. Um, but I am slightly concerned that there, it, there was that point early in summer where like Grant Shapps unveiled his big transport master plan and it was actually it was actually quite exciting and progressive. For, um, and you know I was, I was having warm feelings towards Grant Shapps which was an entirely new and unfamiliar sensation for me. Um, but there were lots of good stuff in that transport plan. And, you know, TFL was coming out with these plans to talk about getting uh, private cars off a bunch of central London roads. We've seen similar things in Manchester. All this stuff is great. But it is also slightly scribbling around the margins. Like there was another bit of that, of that transport master plan. Uh, there was one billion pounds set aside for the duelling of the A66 between Middlesbrough and Workington, um, which is not a, a massively well-populated route across the north of England. Um, that's that. I'm sure that's a that's an important project. I'm sure that'll be very useful economically to to, to Cumbria and 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 the Tyneside. That's not Tyneside. Is it? You know what I mean? Um, the northeast. Um, however, that's still four times the amount that's been set aside for cycling stuff on a single road in a not very well populated part of the north of England. And the danger is we are. And, and you know, the Grant Chapter is now is now saying that if councils don't uh, consult properly with their residents, they are going to lose this two hundred and fifty million pound for walking and cycling fund for walking and cycling. Um, so there's not that much money there in the first place, and now it looks a lot like the transport sector is slightly getting cold feet about it. And I think the reason for that is because the people who will lose out from from reducing road space tend to be a lot noisier and more visible, and also I suspect a lot torier than the people who who would gain from it. This government has, has actually been quite good at telling large chunks of, chunks of the electorate to, to, to bugger off because it doesn't like them very much. I think the problem here is that the motoring lobby is probably a bit of the electorate this government is quite keen on. I don't know how we embed this stuff, but I am worried that actually we've probably seen a lot of the progress on that sort of thing that we're going to. Um, and I'm not sure there's going to be much more from here. Thank you. Um, right, we've got, we've got very little time left and we've got lots of questions, so I'm going to roll questions uh, into each other. We've got a question here from Martin uh, Caulfield of Atalanta uh, Motors, which is a zero emissions delivery uh, vehicle developer. And we've also got a question from Tom Higgs uh, at Octopus Electric Vehicle. Both those questions uh, um, uh, are looking at zero emissions and at how much the public uh, knows about zero emissions. I'm going to I'm going to go to the more specific one on uh, from from Martin on what immediate push there is to incentivise last mile parcel delivery companies to adopt uh, zero emission solutions because I find it's always easier to ask something that's quite specific. But uh, if you can also answer from Tom a question more about how we how we make the public uh, more aware. Uh, that, 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 that in just 20 years time, all new cars need to be zero emissions. Uh, and that's to you, Kerry. Okay, on the first one, I'm not aware that the government has particularly got a strategy on this. I think I've got a letter into the department waiting for a response at the moment. Um, the I think the main driver of it might well be, um, although 
some of the clean air zones are sort of slightly up in the air at the moment and being put on hold because of um, progress has been made in other ways during lockdown. But obviously, if you've got clean air zones in city centres, which either impose a charge on polluting vehicles or ban them altogether, then that would be an incentive for companies to look at um, cleaner alternatives, including e-cargo bikes or, or, or sort of vans. There's some concern, you know, if you're talking more generally about white van man in the, the city centre, is that because a lot of these people would be self-employed and will really have had their incomes hit during COVID, um, it's asking them quite a lot to um, then make an investment in a new, in the short term expensive vehicle. Um, and, you know, that's something that I think we need to see something from the government in terms of how they're going to, you know, in the same way, like with the taxi trade, making the, the transition over and, and they've been badly hit during lockdown. But I'm not aware of any specific plans for the government to, to support people financially or to impose any sort of um, uh, onus on them to actually do that. On the broader things about EVs and the, the shift, I suppose 2040 is quite a long way off and if people are buying vehicles now, um, you still would be looking to replace that um, by 2040 in, in most cases. But I, what we have seen is electric vehicles, although we're still, we're, we're nowhere near on course to actually meet, uh, say, a 2035, 100% um, of new sales uh, being electric vehicles or, or other clean fuels. Um, it was about three or four percent of the market. I think during the last few months, it's it's got up to about ten percent new vehicle sales, but there's still a long way to go. And um, the government strategy is just about making the charging infrastructure, you know, rolling it out. I think there was something said in chat about how there were far more charging points than petrol stations, but the big difference is you spend what less than five minutes at a petrol station, you can refuel your car. In, in no time at all. Whereas a charging point, if you want to get it up to 100%, even on the most rapid chargers, you're looking at 45 minutes or so. Oh. So um, I'm in the same position as, as Natalia with, I've got an electric vehicle, I live in a block of flats where I can't charge it. So I'm reliant on public charging points. And now um, there's, you know, there's competition for them. <laughs> you, you sort of go there and somebody else has just started charging. So that means you're facing a 90 minute wait you know, 45 minutes for them to charge and another 45 minutes for you to charge, which um, isn't feasible. But I, I think the, the sort of answer about the public not being aware will probably pretty quickly be dealt with by the fact that there are so many companies bringing forward new vehicles, the charging infrastructure will start to appear. Um, but as I said right in the introductory remarks, my concern is that when you get into more remote areas, and particularly if you go to rural areas where tourism so to speak, so Cornwall or Devon or whatever, uh, once you get off the motorway network, you don't get those public charging points. I went up to Northumberland um, during the summer break. And, you know, once you're off the motorway, it's very, very difficult to find somewhere to charge your car. And I think obviously people who live there are quite likely to have the space to be able to drive, charge their car at home. But if you want to encourage tourism um, in areas that aren't accessible by public transport, then you've got to look at that there might not necessarily be a, a, a commercial argument for putting a charging point in in place but at some point that's going to have to be there's going to have to be that sort of blanket coverage great um i'm gonna i'm gonna um whiz us on we've got a question here from richard anderson of imperial college london's transport supply strategy center and i'm also going to roll that into a question from uh giles bailey of strategy which is a demand side question which really probably falls on uh michael yeah if you're uh, to be ready for this, uh, both those questions are around how do we deal with the the passenger demand uh, being low in in uh, city centres? How do we stop a death spiral of lower service levels, less maintenance and investments, uh, which then leads to even fewer passengers? If you can answer that in uh, in, uh, in thirty seconds, uh, you're doing very well. Well, look, I think um, you, know, you raised uh, a very good point. Um, the w w one perspective on this is that particularly at the moment anyway uh, until there is a, some kind of return of, of demand um, you're seeing uh, uh, transport moving into one of those areas that, that does require uh, some kind of subsidy for the sake of public good 
you know, uh, we, that was that was the situation we found ourselves in. We had to come to a funding agreement with the government so we could maintain services. Um, and I think, you know, we're uh, we're going through it certainly a phase. Um, can tell you the length of that where it's moving into a, a social good. It's going to require investment. It's going to require um, a, you know review of what's the most efficient way of, of funding these things because you know, as you say you know, of course so what we want to do is provide an inclusive service that allows people to get away in the best you know possible way around, around, around the city we, we don't want a car-based recovery and you can make structural interventions like that but you know but keeping a good reliable safe service that, uh, that customers like will require funding so I think there's there, there, there is a a debate to be had about if and how you could restructure uh, a public sector transport finance, um, uh, you know, for the long term, given what we now know uh, about potentially lower certainty with revenue, um, but also, uh, as you say, once you've lost transport it's, and when you've taken services down, it's very hard to bring them back. So I think that, you know, we, we, we do need to find a way of doing it. But, you know, I'm afraid I haven't got the answer there um, uh, other than it's going to require support uh, until a new equilibrium can be found. Great, thank you. And I'm just going to uh, finish on one uh, point that Hannah Such from Go Jauntly makes, uh, which we, we always uh, forget about because no one gets paid uh, by walking companies. But she really says, what's your view of? Uh, walking being the uh, future of local transport and I'm, I'm not going to put that to everyone uh, because we are out of time but I just say um, absolutely the more we, we uh, walk around uh, Hannah the, the, uh, the uh, better. Thank you to all our panellists today we are Higginson Strategy this was a Expert Bureau uh, event if you'd like to hear more about Expert Bureau and our panellists please uh, do get in contact with us we will uh, send those of you who are in, in attendance today a short note um, uh, summarising some of the points that our great panellists made. So thank you uh, to all of you.